In Jeff Rice's Digital Detroit, Jeff Rice is taking on the task of attempting to shift us away from thinking about places as fixed entities that can be defined as being this thing or that, or this place or that, and instead thinking of them as networks of databases. Dynamic, shifting, multi-layered, and always on the move. Walking the city then becomes the act of writing the city. It is not about walking the most efficient route, although it might be at times. It is about allowing alternate stories to emerge that can help to lead us away from grand defining narratives and help lead us to the excluded stories that need and want to be heard. Our old friend Barth gets into the mix through his telling of a story about the Eiffel Tower in Paris. He can only tell it, as is true for all of us, through the space's connection to himself. We cannot separate ourselves from our encounters with space. We understand through accessing our personal database, and we form a relationship with the space in this way. Rice's space is Detroit. I couldn't help but read with my own experiences in New York in mind. Neither place is fixed. Both are networks of meanings created through complex interactions. They are not grand narratives. This is what we must unlearn. In Rice's terms, they are complex accounts of the very many. Really, what else could they be? The very many is a concept worth noting, for places cannot be singular entities. They can only be understood by multiplicities of experience. Urban places can only be seen as a network of the very many people, things, ideas, issues, concerns, and spaces that together can become to be known as New York, Detroit, or even Clemson. We are always already shaped by who we are when encountering a place. Our database of identity is filled with information gleaned from what we've seen, read, heard, felt, smelled, and experienced. Without these elements, we cannot come to any kind of understanding of place. Without the personal connection, the place can only be non-place. Rice brings up the curious implications of the online map. All of us, of course, are quite familiar with this map. However, in this representation, our space has become digital information that in turn becomes a public image. I'm reminded of Barton and Barton's arguments concerning maps being reflective of power relations. They only show what we want them to. Quote, the object of this text, therefore, is not to present an expected reading of the city, but instead to offer something else. I'm thinking, the excluded of two third meaning, perhaps? Back to Rice's quote, something that isn't entirely expected, nor completely absurd, something that is networked. The digital city, just like the physical one, is not merely a clustering of structures. Tall buildings or visually rich websites, they are something more. They succeed and thrive not because they simply have the structure, they thrive when they become places of interesting and productive interactions and relationships. We are all then walking networks that are in perpetual interaction with the layers upon layers of networks that surround us. We occupy a system of information that relies on a cycle of contribution and consumption. We give to and take from these networks to create a dynamic system that is constantly in flux and refuses to ever be fixed. Maps themselves have become dynamic. Rice uses the example of the Google Maps wayfaring feature that allows users to annotate and comment on places represented on the maps. The map then becomes something more. By networking with other non-mapping databases, the personal experiences of the user contribute to an emerging psychogeographic mapping function. These new functions in digital mapping technology then allow for a rupture to form. A space is created where the personal interaction with the physical space and what other kind of interaction with space is there comes into being. Emotions, feelings, difficult to define characteristics can be felt in relation to the physical space. We seem to still be firmly rooted in the Platonist Aristotelian Ramus tradition when thinking about places. That is to say, when we look at a city, we expect that certain elements are situated in certain places that give rise to grand narratives of meaning. This is an act of violence. By doing so, we are again excluding and constraining alternate possibilities. By breaking away from these traditions, and technology can help us to do just that, we come to a crossroads where how we define a best route is no longer based on efficiency. The route then transcends the shortest distance between two points, and notions of personal interactions with space find their room to play. Rice cites Casey in arguing, quote, for a broader understanding of place that recognizes how various forces coming together, and we assume breaking apart, lead to a place's shifting and moving status. The metaphor, it seems, is one of travel. Place moves. 
Therefore, the city is far more than spatial arrangements between structures. It is not a simple matter of how markers are arranged in relation to one another. Those markers interact with each other and us, reflecting each other while at the same time inventing each other in new and often unpredictable ways. What we need, then, is Mitchell's economy of presence. That allows us to be simultaneously communal and proximal. It grants us the ability to shift and adapt our own identities while allowing the place we encounter to do the same. The place becomes experiential and unique. It can never be encountered in the same way twice. So what we must do then is replace the grand narrative with something else. Grand narratives are a means of nailing something into place. The place cannot be other than the narrative. But this also includes the problems of the place. Since they too are a part of the narrative, they cannot be removed and addressed. They are always already there. Perhaps the biggest problem with grand narratives, and particularly with regard to urban problems, is that they tell a story where progress is over and the city is doomed, or progress is on the way. In either case, progress is still conspicuously absent. It is either en route or has come and gone, but it's never already there. I'll end with Jeff Rice's quote from Kevin Lynch. Nothing is experienced by itself, but always in relation to its surroundings, the sequences of events leading up to it, the memory of past experiences. These memories are our personal databases, our personal networks. They allow us to unfix the place so the crucial alternative meanings can emerge. <laughs>